Okay, members, now we come to uh, uh, Senate File 826. I hope uh, Senator Dibble is here. If not, I would like to ask the staff to please let him know that we're ready. Uh, members, I know absolutely well that we have a number of individuals who wish to testify on this issue. I know you have a, a number of concerns that we're going to try to address. We will have an hour and 40 minutes to do this. It is my belief that that will be sufficient time, but this room has been reserved for tonight so that we can continue. Uh, oh, it's room 123, I'm sorry. Uh, it's room 123, and uh, we can continue uh, hearing this bill if we're not able to hear all of the testimony uh, after 6 p.m. So um, we will reconvene at 6 p.m. if we're not able to finish. I have talked to the author about this bill and have expressed my uh, serious desire to uh, accommodate the, the members' uh, requests that we focus our testimony on our amendments and hearing on issues related to implementation of this bill. As you recall, we had significant testimony that came to us from parents, uh, teachers, educators, children who came to testify before us. I understand that this issue is uh, it's really an important issue for families and parents. I respect that. I wish I could accommodate uh, the time to hear those testimonies again, but unfortunately this is a short session, so I cannot accommodate uh, that uh, again. We're going to do our very best, because I know this is a, a personal issue for so many individuals, uh, to hear at least brief testimony from individuals who have really co contacted my office time and time again. They wish to be heard. Uh, we're going to do our very best, but I want you to know that 75 people have signed up for testimony. We cannot hear 75 people. I'm sorry. Uh, so we're going to focus the testimony on the amendment that has been prepared by multiple senators. There has been a number of hearings, and I want to publicly uh, say thank you to Senator Clausen. I think Senator Clausen uh, has been really a champion uh, going around uh, the state of Minnesota, listening to school administrators in particular, and uh, superintendents and principals who see in uh, Senator Clausen a person who has their experience, who have really dealt with implementation uh, year after year. So I think that they felt that he has a good perspective and a good grasp of what it means to implement policy like this. And he um, collected this information with Senator Dibble, who is the author of this bill, and put before us a recommendation that we hope addresses all of your concerns. But if not, obviously we will have uh, plenty of opportunities to uh, put amendments uh, before the committee and have that discussion today. So with that, I would like to um, open the discussion on uh, Senate File 826, and I believe that Senator Dibble is here. It's House File 826, Madam Chair. Sorry. Uh, for the record. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Peterson. So is House File 826. Senator Dibble is here, and uh, I believe, Senator, that you have an amendment that has been distributed, and I believe is the A32 amendment. Yeah. So it's the A32 amendment, and is before you. So um, Senator Dibble uh, moves the A32 amendment in order to put the bill in the form that. Uh, Sorry, you're not have a member of the been committee. Named a member of the committee. <laughs> <laughs> I think Senator Clausen was intending to Senator either that or the A31 is a line and page, no. uh, either or. So Senator Nino has a question before we go there. Senator Nino. Yes, Madam Chair. Before we get into the, the merits of the amendment or, or the bill, I, I, I really do have to just go on the record with some protests on the process. Um, but we do have Senate rules. Senate rules do specify that to the extent practicable, we're supposed to have three days' notice. Um, had had we just had the original bill back before us, I, I guess it wouldn't have been so concerning to me because we're, we're basically having a pro forma committee session at that point. But when we have this bill come before us with a completely rewritten delete all, um, now there may be people that couldn't get here today because they didn't, we barely had a day's notice with the agenda item. It just 
slightly over 24 hours. There may be people that couldn't get that into their sk schedule to be here to request testimony. I understand not everyone can testify. We can't put 100 people at the table. Um, but maybe they would have wanted to even just be here to experience and talk to legislators in the hallway. Uh, there's reasons why we have these Senate rules, and sometimes we can't do a three-day notice. But we're not up against deadline. We could have heard this on Thursday or next Tuesday, or uh, and I, just as a matter of form, good form or bad form, um, I, I don't think that was the proper uh, way to go about bringing this bill up, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. And uh, I want to make sure I do have a letter that came from uh, Minority Leader uh, Senator Nelson expressing that concern as well, and, and we talked about it yesterday. I want to make sure, uh, Senators, that you know the reason I accommodated this hearing today is because next, time, next uh, Thursday we are going to have a full agenda with a number of uh, bills that came to my attention that need to go to the next, uh, new next level like you saw today. There are several stops for many of the bills that you author. There are small bills, but we need significant time. The other issue is we have a significant reform that is being offered on ELL for which a number of districts of associations have been working uh, for a number of years. The House is going to hear that testimony in the morning. They have requested weeks ago that we uh, accommodate those testimonies for the afternoon, and that's the schedule for Thursday. The omnibus bill will be rolled out on Tuesday next week. Uh, I want you to have that language for you to think about it for at least a week, because that would not be fair uh, not to have enough time and give you uh, the omnibus bill on Thursday for you to reply on Thursday and then move it forward. So uh, is the protocol that we adopted uh, collaboratively that you want to have those bills before you at least for three or four days in advance in order to see it? So as you can tell, the, the deadline for those uh, particular bills uh, actually are approaching really fast. And so we gave an opportunity to Senator Dibble. Uh, he has several stops for this bill as well, and we want to make sure that he will be able to move it forward. So um, the protocol for a number of years has been 24 hours. I, you know quite well, Senator, I put my staff to pull out the agendas, and I will not do this, but during the years that I was in the minority, actually that rule was never, never followed, uh, never. There were no 24 hours given to minority members. Uh, those agendas were not posted. So, but I will not gonna, I'm not gonna argue on protocol and how we haven't followed protocol. I think 24 hours has been a protocol we posted. Within 24 hours, we have the notice. So I hope we can accommodate Senator Dibble since he has to move these uh, to different committees and meet other deadlines. Just, just a quick comment, Senator Madam Chair. My, my point there was not to say, let's adjourn the meeting and not hear this bill here today. I, I understand that I hear you. The, the, the rule was not violated. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, this hearing here today is perfectly in compliance with the letter of the rule. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but my, my point was I, th I think it could have been handled differently and still been fully accommodated with the, with the full schedule. Thank you, Senator Nino. Senator Chamberlain. Yeah, just to add to that point, Madam Chair, is this is not a, a um, this bill is significantly different in weight and breadth and depth than and than <coughs> any other most other legislation we've seen, and that is why I and some others would believe that this would require some additional care and attention. This bill reaches into uh, our homes, to our children, to those very people <coughs> we love and cherish the most, and into our schools. This will have a wide-ranging, deep impact uh, on them, and that is why this bill needed full vetting. Uh, this is a complete delete-all. We received that this morning, and uh, due to the, uh, ex the, the <coughs> gravity of this policy and this law, it deserves more attention and time. It's not simply a 2299 where we're dealing with some technical fixes. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just to clarify, just so that uh, we're all aware, um, Rule 12.3 of the Senate Rules of the 88th Legislature reads, 
12.3, to the extent practical, a committee, subcommittee, or division shall announce each meeting to the public at least three calendar days before convening. Uh, the notice must state the name of the committee, the subcommittee, the division, the bills or the bills to be considered, the place, the time of the meeting. So um, I think the point is that um, I don't think our Senate rules were followed. Um, I do understand that um, we're on a tight time frame here. Um, but the point is really uh, beyond whether Rule 12.3 was followed, which it, it clearly was not. And quite frankly, the, the bill was re-referred to this committee, and I want to thank you for that, because it had been um, sent, I think, directly to finance. And so I applaud you for getting the bill before this committee where these important policy decisions can be discussed. And so I, I really thank you for your leadership to get that done. Um, but it is unfortunate that the public wasn't given the notice. The bill was re-referred on Thursday of last week, and so it would have been very helpful to Minnesotans all across the state who are very interested in this bill and following it, very concerned uh, about students and their welfare and our schools. Um, certainly, if, if this had been posted that it was on the agenda uh, today so that they could have made plans to, to be here, to listen, um, or what I, as a policymaker, uh, the piece that I'm really missing is because of the um, lack of timing and the delete all amendment that has come to us right now today, although I did get my copy this morning on my desk, um, I've not had a chance to talk to my constituents, my school districts, about if this delete all amendment actually is going to alleviate the, their concerns. Uh, prior to this delete all amendment, um, there were concerns, and so I guess my point is it's just it, it would have been helpful had we had that agenda item out for the public and if we could see that delete all amendment. But uh, I do appreciate the fact that uh, the bills proceeding forward, I know that you're committed to make sure we get those to review them, and I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you for your concerns. Senator. major policy issue here that we have been talking about, not just for me, but we've been talking about this for months. And, and now we have a four-hour notice on this video, and I think that that's a very unfortunate thing. And I also think that you've just stated now in this committee that on Thursday that we will have a very large committee hearing on Thursday, and I've checked my schedule, and I have no notice today is Tuesday. And so you obviously are aware of what we are going to look at on Thursday, but yet none of us have had, or the public, have had the opportunity to see that agenda. So I would ask you that we have a little uh, better communication and more notification, not only for people at this table, but for all the folks, because for maybe for some of these folks that are out in the hallway, they have a half-hour drive. I have people that have come four hours today to drive here who cannot testify, called ahead of time, cannot testify in their voice, and I think that's a travesty. Uh, Senator Rood, uh, I would like to instruct the staff to bring the individuals who brought, who drove here for four hours. Uh, so I would like to ask the surgeon to please uh, make sure that uh, you provide uh, we will ask some individuals who are here, you know, we are at capacity, but I certainly don't want to have people outside in the hallway, people who have driven four hours to come to testify. I would like to uh, uh, ask staff to please uh, find out from Senator Rood uh, who are the individuals who are outside and they need to come in. And I would appreciate, uh, Blanca, if you could ask, uh, and, and I'll ask members of the public if you could uh, indulge the members because we need to make sure that members, that individuals from the community who drove here for hours need to get in this room. Uh, my intent is not to, to block their participation. We're going to be here until we hear from everyone. Senator Thompson. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And slightly different angle on this. I, I think everybody knows that, you know, with, uh, with power comes additional responsibility. And uh, your party controls the House, the Senate, the governor's office. We've seen this movie before. A lot of tax things were jammed through at the end of the last session because we didn't have the votes to stop them. We're now in the midst of repealing a lot of them because people know the damage that was done to the state of Minnesota. I think there's a perception that um, 
because the other side doesn't have to be taken into account at all. You can kind of do to Minnesotans and to the minority party what you want with minimal notice. And that's not good for the process. It's not good for how our system is supposed to work. And we've certainly seen that um, in some instances uh, we have to undo some things because we're not doing things thoughtfully. And in terms of the overall schedule of the session, I personally am glad for a short session. But again, the majority party controls when this session started. And if there was so much work to be done that it couldn't be done between uh, February 25th and the adjournment date, then a longer session should have been scheduled. I don't think it's fair to say, well, we're going to deny uh, some of these people adequate notice, well, because we got a short session here. That was the majority's decision as to when we started the session. So I'm just concerned that um, there really isn't an opportunity for <coughs> for the minority to certainly to to block anything and even to be heard. And I think that that's a real concern for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Thompson. So for the record, I uh, want uh, <clears throat> members and the public to know that it is within protocol and within <coughs> the rule described by Senator Nelson that we provide enough time when practicable to the public and the protocol adopted by the Senate is 24 hours. We posted 24 hours in advance. This bill was posted yesterday for a hearing. This is the first time, this is the first time on the first issue I hear that is incredibly, um, that is problematic. Um, I have to say, and with all of the respect, Senator Dibble, I care very deeply about this issue, but for me, it's not the most important issue. It's a very important issue, and I want to give it all the opportunity, the time. I want to give the public ample time, but clearly we have a number of issues, and Senator Rood, thank you for uh, the, the input on posting. We're going to diligently post as early as we possibly can and make sure that you have these notice in advance. 24 hours has been uh, really the practice within the Senate. Uh, again, I'm not gonna go into history responding to Senator Thompson about the practices when I was in the minority, uh, but there were many instances when I came to committee and there was no agenda posted until we arrived. So it was never practical to have it posted um, when I was in the minority. but. I am not going to take us there because I know how difficult it is for members to put together these amendments, for chairs to coordinate all of the bills that are presented by members and making sure that all of you have ample opportunities really to have your voices heard here as well as your bills uh, heard before committee. So Senator Dibble, please proceed to present. Uh, Oh, before we uh, have Senator uh, Dibble uh, presenting, we are have to adopt the 832 amendment. amendment. So, and Senator Chair, Dibble. If folks are anxious about a delete all, there's actually a line in page, the A31, you know, which which may be at your places. I'm not sure. It's, you know, it's, uh, you know, so it's un unlike some of the ways that this amendment has been characterized. It's not a total reworking of the bills, responding to some technical issues. If that would help matters, it's, the A31 is a, is, a, is a line and page amendment. The A32 was drafted just to engross the changes to allow for better ease of reading. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I think that's very helpful, and I think Senator Clausen had a comment about this. So this is what the amendment contains, uh, members. It's just one page. So this is the actual bill that was already heard. So it looks like it's a long bill, but that's the amendment. Senator Clausen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A31 line and page amendment. Oh, and, and Madam Chair, if Senator I could Dibble. request the change of one word on line 1.30. Change that last word and to or. Uh, to, uh, Senator Dibble, could you h hold on on that and we will do the verbal amendment before we we have to proceed with Senator Claus. So, Senator Claus, could you Just incorporate that go on your amendment again? Yeah. 
Um, Madam Chair. I just just for Senator Chamberlain. So tell him to put his mic on. Major is actually commitment and then delete all his delete all his encompasses this, correct? In gross, yeah, they're the same thing. Right. Madam Thank you. Thank you. So the new language is here, but this is the engrossed bill. So um, I, I hope that is clear to members. Senator Clausen. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to offer the A31 line and page amendment with a verbal uh, change on line 1.30, where we change the word and to or. Okay. On the amendment, <coughs> Senator Peterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I understand that uh, the author had mentioned that most of the changes were technical. To the extent that there aren't any or that are borderline technical, if the author could go through those changes prior to the adoption of the A31, that would be great. Thank you, Senator Peterson. I think that's a good request. Um, Senator Dibble or Senator Clausen or both, if you could uh, please go through the amendment before we adopt it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I can describe the changes and maybe Ms. Butler can, can help me find the, the exact spots if people want to view the language, but I'll, I'll, I'll just cover what the amendment changes by topic. Um, and then if we need to drill down and find the actual um, language um, in the amendment, um, happy to pause and have Ms. Butler help me do that. Thank you, um, Senator Dibble. If you could give right. our council just a little bit of time All to right. kind of put it together so that she, she right. can help you after you go through this to Great. make sure that uh, members will be able to locate the language of the amendment in the bill. Okay. Thank you. You ready? Okay. She's ready. Go ahead, Senator. All right. And just uh, by way of context, uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, um, these changes are uh, in large part responsive to um, the ideas that uh, a number of groups have brought forward and articulated um, since this bill. We last saw this bill on the Senate floor. Um, you know, organizations like the School Boards Association, the administrators, the, the uh, primary and secondary principals, and, uh, uh, and you know, those, those kinds of organizations, as well as members of the general public that have um, uh, discovered some, some good ideas. And, and really the goal of, of the amendment is to ease some of the implementation aspects um, uh, so that our efforts to address bullying can be successful. We, um, we also eliminated some, some sections, so I'll try to uh, mention those. Um, so first of all, a, a, an issue was raised around training volunteers um, and, uh, you know, full-on, full-scale training of volunteers was, was never intended. Um, so we, we uh, make mention of, you know, determining kind of what the, the roles and responsibilities of students, school personnel and volunteers are, and then for pretty much the remainder of the bill, we're silent on the subject of volunteers. Um, uh, issue raised about um, exactly how um, anti-bullying policies and, and various policies would be communicated. That's uh, a, a concern that somehow, you know, numerous foreign languages uh, would, would they'd have to be translated. Um, so we just simply say, you know, communicated electronically, you know, just as per typical how a school district or a school would communicate things of this nature, um, just make it consistent with that. Posting throughout the building has been changed to uh, posting uh, the, bill, the uh, policy, the adopted policy in summary form just in the office. Um, uh, a big, a, kind of a bigger issue was around uh, uh, data collection and um, uh, analysis uh, and, th and that sort of thing. Um, that's been removed from the bill entirely um, towards the back of the bill where we see um, the climate Council and the Climate Center. Um, they've been tasked with taking a look at that subject. Um, if you remember, the members of the Climate Council are comprised of various <coughs> members of state agencies, um, the, the various uh, professional organizations, um, like the school administrators and stuff, law enforcement personnel. So they're going to take a look at that question and, and make a recommendation at some point in the future, um, but, but that has been removed. Um, the definition of bullying, um, is probably the most significant change, and you can see that um, <clears throat> under definitions um, starting on line 1.23. Um, and uh, uh, 
the definition of bullying, um, first of all, reference to harassment has been removed. Uh, harassment is dealt with already in our statutes and already there's direction to schools and school districts to deal with harassing conduct. Um, so that's considered somewhat different than what we're talking about uh, here. So that's been removed. Um, so it's confined to intimidating, threatening, abusive, or harming conduct um, with the kind of a, a four-pronged test if one of these, one or more of these elements is presence, it's the imbalance of power, that's pretty important. Um, uh, conduct is repeated or forms a pattern, also thought to be uh, very, very important, rises to the level of material and substantial interference with the student and, dis and disrupts the, the work of the school. Um, and then, uh, of course, we, we uh, make sure that we include cyberbullying in that and then uh, go on to uh, uh, talk about what intimidating, threatening, or abusive or harming conduct involves and you can read that starting on the next page, um, 2.1 through 2.12. Um, physical harm, uh, harm to property, uh, uh, reasonable fear of harm, uh, violates reasonable expectations of privacy, defamation, infliction of emotional distress, um, and then we have the, the uh, enumerated characteristics but we're clear that prohibited conduct need not be based on any particular characteristic defined in this paragraph. That's where um, we make sure that all students are protected, um, uh, but also, of course, making sure that those who receive the disproportionate kind of this attention um, are, are protected. Um, so that's, and, and also just so members know, kind of reorganize the definitions section a little bit just to get all the definitions kind of plopped into one place. That's just kind of a organizational matter for the bill itself. Um, there was a subject raised around um, individual education plans and 504 plans, um, and of course, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. Are we heaping, uh, not just here, but in, in a number of different places, are we heaping all kinds of requirements into the special ed system that create more work and more expense and, and more paperwork? Um, so um, there's a suggestion that, that uh, when a, a special needs or a, or a child with disabilities um, is either the target or the actor, that that team is taking a look at that subject um, and because they, a typical response may or may not be appropriate in that instance, um, but it's, it's in permissive language and, and not requirement. Um, we did change some language around, we, we needed to recognize um, the reality that um, we had originally said we're, this, is only, this is only applicable between students who attend the same school, but of course we know a lot of schools are co-located, so what about what to do in that instance? Um, a lot of schools come together to form teams, um, so what to do in that instance? So we uh, create some language that recognizes those circumstances where, school, where students come together uh, from across uh, different schools. Um, the, the review of policies, the occasional review, we had originally said was on an annual basis. We just simply say now that's entirely up to the school district to occasionally review these policies, update them if, if need be, um, but on the normal cycle that they would typically <coughs> so do. Um, there was a, a section in there that talked not to rules or guidance per se, but it kind of indicated that there would be rules or guidance coming from the Commissioner of Education. Um, I think that had actually been intended to be taken out quite a while ago, but it is out. Um, a concern that investigations would have to be concluded in three days, again, not the attention, some grammatical clarification that, um, you know, responding to a, a reported incidents, um, incident would have to start in three days, not, not conclude in, in three days. There's some language later in the bill um, around um, allowable use of staff development dollars and expectations of staff development outcomes. Um, those sections were dropped and simply consolidated up in the earlier section where we talk about um, staff development uh, activities. Um, again, a, a section later in the bill that talks about uh, mandating the development of online policies for school computers and, and that sort of thing. That's been dealt with previously by other statutes and also is dealt with somewhat earlier in the bill, so that section was dropped. Um, and that's, I think that's the extent of the changes. I just wanted to remind members that we've made a, a number of changes as well in response to issues and concerns and ideas uh, that were raised as the bill wound its way through the, its uh, process last year. Um, I don't remember all of them, frankly, but I do remember um, uh, clarifying uh, uh, that there was a presumption of notification uh, to parents uh, if, if their child is either the target or an actor. 
Um, training doesn't occur on an annual cycle, but on a, on a three-year cycle uh, for uh, existing personnel. Um, tightening up the language around real and substantial effects of, uh, focused on the disruption or the interruption of educational experience and, and the work of the school. Um, the construction of law section where we make sure that existing rights are maintained, none are expanded, none are, are reduced. Oh, uh, another one I'm sorry that I missed that's in the, in the, the, lead, or in the line and page is uh, uh, some concern that somehow we're mandating the engagement of community organizations, students and personnel in the development of these policies. Uh, we make that language permissive and we encourage that to occur, but we don't mandate that. I think that uh, captures uh, the extent of the, uh, the technical changes in front of you. Um, I'll look to Ms. Butler. Did I get them all? You said to do. Um, Ms. Butler. Madam Chair and members, there's just one other change that um, on the uh, um, School Climate Council, oh, right. there's a change in membership. Um, just down to 23 members and taking off the Board of Teaching and Board of School Administrators, but putting on the Minnesota Association of School Administrators. Thank you, Ms. Butler. Uh, Senator Dibble, I uh, have asked if you could uh, extend, I, I know that we tried very hard to make sure that uh, school administrators, people who represent uh, the school superintendents, principals, and individuals who will be responsible for implementing these policy be in the room because uh, obviously members want to hear from them as to whether or not the amendment uh, articulates the input that you provided over the summer. So um, I don't know if you have any uh, particular individuals or sh if I should call uh, individuals in the room who would be willing to uh, share their perspective as to whether or not this amendment actually um, articulates some of the concerns that uh, some of the administrators had with respect to implementation of the language and whether or not the deleted language right. accommodates their concerns or not. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think you have at least a couple of letters. I think uh, there's a, an array of them holding up the western wall over here. Any, anyone are invited. Uh, I know a couple have uh, indicated an interest in stepping up to the table. So I would in, invite. Thank you. Sure. We would totally appreciate your, your uh, input in this because uh, as you know, members, we uh, passed this bill in committee, but clearly we heard over the summer that there were issues related to implementation of these language that we really needed to address. And so most of this language comes from input from the public, um, really related to the technical aspects of this bill. Uh, Thank you. Madam Welcome Chair, to the committee. Roger Aronson is here, who I have to say um, came, the, came the farthest. But I have to tell you, uh, as we're putting together some technical details, uh, he was uh, sipping a pina colada on the beach and texting and, and uh, emailing us. <laughs> Multitasking. Madam, Madam Chair yes. and members, um, and, and Senator Dibble still has to talk to my wife about why we had to come back early. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Thank you. Chair and members. Um, if you could please just introduce yourself for a little I'm Roger Arnson. I'm counsel for the elementary and the secondary principals associations. And, and we've spent a lot of time um, going over various issues with um, a large group of, of um, folks who know things about these particular language provisions and, and the technical provisions of this and um, um, we're very pleased with. Um, some of the, the core elements of bullying that go through Hazel, the hazelton Olveus piece have to do with uh, the imbalance of power and the pattern questions. Those are now included in the definition um, as it comes in front of you. Um, as, as Senator Dibble um, mentioned in, in his introductory piece, uh, you end up with a laundry list of bad behavior. On the front end, it'll say bullying is intimidating, threatening, abusive, or harmful conduct that's objectively offensive. So we set this initial standard of inappropriate conduct that, that kids might engage in. And then we add a couple conditions to it to make it bullying. It, 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 we can discipline a lot of conduct, but there's some that we want to characterize specifically as bullying. And if you notice, then we talk about if there's the imbalance of power, um, that the conduct's repeated or forms a pattern. And then again, we're back to the kind of the general statements that it materially and substantially interferes with the child's educational opportunities or um, disrupts the discipline of the school. Now initially it had said and, and we'll have to talk a little bit about whether any of these need to be linked a little directly. I mean the pattern, I mean the fact that it's just bad and it's a pattern probably isn't 
as tight as we'd want, but we can talk about that a little bit as we go along. But the, the, it, this is in really good shape um, as it comes here today. As you go through some of the issues that were major concerns as we went along, Initially, we required mandatory training of every staff member that we had. Now we've got that off to a cycle of three years. That makes a lot of sense, and that's a lot of accommodation, and we can do that in schools. There's some notification provisions that really concern school principals about every individual incident. Um, uh, the senator has accommodated the school principal's questions on that, and we fix that now, so we think it really works well on behalf of kids. We had a concern about training, uh, mandatory training of every volunteer that stepped into a school on the bullying uh, matter. And, and just that it was more than we needed to do. And the senators accommodated us on that. This draft accommodates that. It makes it work. Um, so there is, um, uh, it, it was, actually it was kind of uh, interesting. Um, the committee administrator said, um, you know, I said, we want to come in and testify on the bill today. And he said, well, are you coming in support or are you coming with concerns? And concerns was kind of code, and we've been through a lot of code about this <laughs> uh, bill. Um, and, and it was, it really was uh, a nice opportunity to say we're coming in support. And we've reviewed these changes with the executive committees of the Principals Association, who involve principals from around Minnesota. And, and um, uh, letters were sent promptly um, uh, for the senator to share with you today. So this really is um, uh, a, a good working bill that we can implement in schools to do good things for, uh, for kids. There are some very good bullying policies in place. Anoka Hennepin has a very good bullying policy and they've had some litigation that resulted in that policy and a lot of hard work um, that went into having that. One of the goals here was that we would have a policy that, that would not require them to redo and reinvent everything that we've done. And, and we've talked about some of these concerns with those folks as well and we think that, that uh, we made it on there um, uh, in visiting with, with their representatives. So, um, and, and not to, everybody, there's a lot of good policies out there as well and there's a provision in here that actually says you don't have to redo your policy, you know, that, that you can clarify it um, as may be necessary. So, Madam Chair, the technical provisions of this we think are, are really in line um, with the goals of, of um, the author and, and with the goals of the committee as well. Thank you, Mr. Ernest. Any questions for the testifier? We really appreciate all the work and uh, appreciate that you spent time of your vacation helping us do this, but it made a tremendous difference. As you know, uh, we really needed to make sure that uh, this can be implemented. Uh, we heard the testimony from many students and parents who really wanted us to move forward, but at the end, uh, the, the, the administrators, superintendents, principals are responsible for the implementation, and that's what really matters. So thank Madam you. Madam Chair, for I would be remiss if I did not uh, acknowledge the work of Senator Claussen as well. I know you pointed it out initially. Um, uh, he is a uh, uh, school principal at heart, and um, that came through a lot, and he was very instrumental in, in moving many of these changes a lot, and we thank Senator Claussen very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Senator Claus, and you're going to hear that a lot. <laughs> so we totally appreciate all of the time that you put into this. Uh, any other uh, person who wishes to testify on this amendment before we move the amendment, just to make sure that if there are any concerns with respect to the technical pieces that have been incorporated, any of the technical language for implementation, uh, we really need to hear from you. and. We encourage you to approach the table because we, there are a number of people who wish to testify and we really want to hear from them as well. So I want to hear on the technical uh, part in the implementation. It's uh, very important. Welcome back to the committee. Ms. Kelleher. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members. My name is Grace Kelleher and I represent the Minnesota School Boards Association. And uh, it is wonderful to be with you today representing school board members. Uh, we want to first of all thank Senator Dibble. Uh, we've been on this journey for a year and a half and uh, it is very considerate that throughout sort of this road that we've been on, we hit some bumps, and, but we've gotten back on the path and see light at the end of the tunnel. We have just received the amendment about a half hour ago, so I, it's premature to say we're 100% supportive but many of the concerns we talked about with our members on implementation were covered and 
once again, thanks to Senator Dibble's uh, concern and Senator Clausen's. Some of the areas in particular uh, we noticed was the volunteer piece, uh, that the definition of bullying was narrowed and harassment excluded. Adding the words perceived imbalance of power and contact that is repeated or forming a pattern really helps clarify that definition uh, in schools. That it be consistent with other policies and be posted where uh, people can see it. That 504 plans um, are optional as well as IEPs. Um, there is no annual reporting of incidences and that three-day investigation was clarified to me and that's a, when the report is due, not necessarily when the investigation is complete. I want to thank uh, board members and thank you all for hearing from your local board members with their concerns about this bill. We have always been interested in how this is really implemented and how it rolls out on the schools and we think this is a huge step forward for this bill. Thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Just uh, thank you for, for reinforcing that message. Any other person who wishes to testify on the technical amendment? If not, uh, members, do you have any other questions for the author or Senator Clausen? That Senator Clausen moves that we adopt the 831 amendment. All of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. no. The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator, do you have any other individuals who wish to testify? Um, uh, Madam Chair, I, I understood um, uh, uh, from our discussion uh, and from direction from the committee administrator that um, that our that testimony was limited to um, the changes uh, in the bill and the and the technical aspects because we've already had quite a bit of testimony around the the purpose, you know, and the and the overarching goals. Of the bill, so so as such, um, asked you know our advocates to to not prepare testimony. That being said, they're ready. Uh, should um, should that uh, be uh, different than than our original understanding? So um, at this point, no. But I'm sure I hope we can reserve the right if uh, in fact um, you know there's there's testimony uh, in opposition or uh, with a different perspective um, that we're able to perhaps uh, respond. Thank you, Senator Dibble, and I know uh, the amount of pressure that you receive in order to, to have more people testify, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, your, your response and, and your communication with the advocates. I myself have a number of requests from my own district uh, of parents who wish to testify uh, in favor and just kind of bring some of the perspectives that were heard last year. and. Uh, it's, it's difficult, but we, we needed to address these technical pieces, and I know this needs to move forward. I'm going to ask the members of the committee, um, as I said, I think we have about uh, requests for 75 people who, wishes, who wish to testify, uh, not related to the amendment that was adopted, but in general they want to uh, provide an opinion, and so we will have to give, you know, uh, really uh, fair time to both sides. Um, uh, Senator Johnson, do you have an opinion? Yes, yeah, Madam Chair and uh, Senator Dibble, um, I've been going through the information that has been distributed to us, and I think it's important to let the public know um, that we have letters from, uh, and these are people you could have testified today, uh, Education Minnesota, which is the teachers, the Association of Metropolitan School District, which represents about 40 percent of the students in our state of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota uh, re representing the Prevention Research Center, uh, the Minnesota Association of Secondary School Principals, Minneapolis Public Schools, the Minnesota Association of Charter Schools, the Minnesota School Social Workers Association, the Diversity Council from um, Rochester, Minnesota, comprised of students. Um, the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, the Minnesota Elementary School Principals Association, and uh, that's it. And Thank you, Senator. Members we and, all and, those. and members who are listening, people who are listening, 
These are the people who run our schools. These are the people who know best what's happening in school. Uh, maybe not home, but school they do. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing me to say that. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Johnson. Yes, Senator Nelson, and I'm going to go to Senator Rood and Senator Kent. Well, actually, Senator just Nelson. a brief uh, question for Senator Johnson. Um, I did not uh, receive that um, um, support from the University of Minnesota. Maybe there's a different letter. The letter I have uh, talks about their important, the importance of strong anti-bullying policies, um, but I didn't, and uh, how important this issue is, but I didn't see where they actually supported that. Maybe you could uh, share that letter with us. Um, Madam maybe Chair, maybe we just didn't get and, it in our packets. Senator Thank you, Carlson, Senator Johnson. Uh, and it may have, maybe I'm not, uh, maybe I did stretch it a little bit, but the final paragraph is, we are committed to the critically important work of supporting the health and well-being of young people and families. Please let us know if we can assist you in any way. Uh, it tells me that they are very supportive of the action that we are taking. And uh, I can give you that. I one. have a copy of you that. You do? Thank okay. You, Thank you, Senators. Senator Rood. Um, Senator, uh, Senator Rood, could you uh, get, oh, I'm sorry, it's very loud outside. Uh, in light of the fact that we just got this um, amendment four hours ago, these letters address the old bill or the new bill? So in other words, are these, are these letters addressing the old bill or the, the new delete all amendment that we got four hours ago? Senator, I, uh, I think generally the letters support the approach we're taking. I think it's a, it's a sound approach. I think the concerns that we had, uh, as you recall, we actually passed this uh, particular bill in the form that uh, was presented. We actually passed that. It was uh, it was moving forward, <coughs> though we heard during the interim that there were some practical elements for the implementation that school administrators thought we needed to address. So uh, we had the the author of the bill heard those concerns. They met with multiple people throughout the state. Many of you met with your school administrators and principals, and we have. Um, incorporated, I believe those, uh, as you heard from testimony, we can hear some more, that those uh, actual concerns have been addressed and that we're moving in the right direction. So that was the piece that was incomplete and we uh, feel now that uh, the author has made enough efforts to work with uh, Senator Claus and to incorporate those concerns and that's what we just amended. So that's what we have before us now. So Senator Root. So, Madam Chair, these letters then would have been written before the delete all. And so it's basically a con they're endorsing the concept, but they've none of these letters address the bill that was just introduced four hours ago. Yes. See, some of them do, Senator. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam Chair. We've talked a lot about the school administrative side of this, which is important, and I very much appreciate um, the work that has been done by Senator Dibble and Senator Claussen and, and the community to get to the point where we are right now. Um, one thing we have not talked about is the parental notification piece. Um, from the time that, that this bill was very first introduced, that was an issue that I raised concerns with Senator Dibble about, and he was receptive to that, and the authors made adjustments at that time and have continued to refine it. And so I just want to um, uh, point that out for the record, um, that this is, was an issue that um, was of concern and this, the, the direction where we have ended up, I think, goes a long way to uh, uh, assuaging a lot of the concerns that people have expressed in that area um, while keeping uh, the well-being and safety of students uh, first and foremost. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Kent. Senator Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to address uh, Senator Rood's concerns, uh, we did meet with a number of stakeholders uh, over the weekend, uh, late uh, Friday, and so the letters that we have really reflect uh, the final changes in what you see today. So, Madam Chair, Mr. Senator Rood. Senator Clausen, so you had the changes done on Friday that we got for our. It was ago? a process that worked through uh, the weekend and into Monday, so, but I'm just going by Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. And Senator Rood, I can assure you that if I said that we're going to hear this on Thursday, it will go on. And if I said Tuesday, it will go on this weekend. If I said next month, it will go on and it will go on because this is the nature of this bill. So no matter when I call the meeting, 
there will be a nuance here, a nuance there, and this is not the end of sessions for anything. This can come back anytime you may, you are, oh, you know, it's open to you to write a bill again and bring it before the legislature. I know that Senator Nelson actually is working on that. She may bring that next year. There are some key elements that she wishes to address that will, you know, come back uh, time and time again, just like everything else. So this is not, this is not the final, the final uh, hour of the process. This process is an open process. It's a democratic process that we will have it open to us every month, every year. So, uh, Senator Chamberlain. Yeah, um, well, it was something instructive here. We've been talking about the letters and, and um, comments you made. Uh, we have a four page, you had said we had passed this bill as is last year, right? We passed it, you know, House File 826 last year. We have now been presented, folks, with four pages of mistakes, four pages of mistakes <coughs> in that bill. But it passed out of here, almost passed on the floor. But here are four pages of mistakes. And of the mistakes in here, there's some major issues. But most of the issues I've been hearing about, Madam Chair, members, have to do with implementing and how good it's going to be for the administrators. Nothing substantially changed in this bill to address the, the trouble it's going to cause our kids. So this is about the innocence of your kids, and nothing in this bill has been done to address that. We have a good bill to prevent bullying. Senator Nelson has it. I signed it. Others did. But these changes are mostly clerical, administrative, technical things with a few mays and shells changed to address the needs of our administrators. That's something. We pass it out of here. It was okay. But now we come back, four pages of changes, and we're supposed to somehow believe that this is now good. And most of those changes are for administrators. We have a bill that addresses all students, protects the parents and the students. This bill helped out the administrators. Thank you. Senator, I hope I'm hearing this correctly, but ultimately we don't, we're not responsible for implementing these policies. These administrators are. So we are hoping that uh, <coughs> We take their concerns very seriously. I um, believe that's our obligation. Uh, yeah, we heard yeah, that. Sure. Yep, and we are doing it uh, to absolutely make sure that our kids are protected, that parents have a voice, and that we have uh, a clear process in place that can actually be a practical, implementable process. Okay, members, uh, if you have no other questions. Um, Madam Chair. Just a, just a process question. Are we going to be able to discuss the bill after we listen to the testimony, or are committee members' comments limited to right now? Well, the amendment before the committee uh, was taken care of. Uh, so the bill now is in the shape that uh, we wish to move forward. We have about 45 minutes to the end of our committee time. If members are willing to hear some testimony before now and then, I will be more than happy to have both sides of the uh, issue uh, present some testimony, unless you have an amendment, uh, Senator, to the bill or any other comments that you wish yes. to offer. Yes. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I do have some comments uh, on the bill and uh, the bill as amended, and uh, perhaps this is the best time uh, to, to address those. I think it's really obvious from our discussion today that every person in this room is very concerned about our students and wants to make sure that we have uh, safe schools for all students, uh, whether it be the University of Minnesota talking about the incidence of bullying and how it's critically important to support the health and well-being of young people and families. I believe everybody realizes that bullying is a serious, serious issue. And uh, as a former teacher, I know that uh, schools need to be places of safety. Uh, without being places of safety, it's very difficult for students to learn. And we want to make sure that our kids are free from bullying and able to concentrate on learning. But I will say that um, 
So that's a, that's a universal belief, I believe, with everyone in this room. And I believe that uh, Senator Dibble's um, lead on this has actually been a good thing in that there's been a lot of discussions across the state and in our communities about safe schools and making sure that kids are safe uh, from bullying and that we prohibit bullying in our schools and so I think that's a good thing when we can have those discussions uh, in the public. Um, until the amendment that uh, we saw, I think I got my copy at um, 8.39 this morning, um, prior to that every school district administrator uh, was had, had concerns about the bill that they were aware of. Now I can tell in the limited amount of time we've had to look at the amendment that um, some of those issues have been addressed and I greatly appreciate that and with my old teacher hat on I've gone through and I've put smiley faces next to those things. <laughs> uh, Senator Dibble, that I think uh, you, I can recall that you have addressed some of those concerns from, uh, from my school districts uh, across the state. There are some that I do not know, I can't tell yet if they have actually uh, been addressed. Um, and those concerns have to do with the cost. And I, I, I'm assuming there's still a $20 million fiscal note. Um, that looks like about, just looking at a $50,000 average teacher salary, that's about 400 teachers. Uh, salaries that we're talking about and so my con my districts are concerned um, I think you've taken care of some of the issues but the ones that I haven't heard addressed yet have to do with the cost and uh, the real cost which it means what you don't get when you buy something else if you're an economist um, what is the real cost of this kind of reminds me a little bit about uh, special education I'm a, a former special education teacher and I know how um, <coughs> well intended all of our special education laws and legislation are, yet on the other hand we know the reality of implementation is that many of our teachers are spending great amounts of time doing paperwork instead of teaching students. And we also know that the, there's a good deal of unfunded mandates in those special education laws, some that we put on ourselves as a state, by the way. Um, and so it's the, the cost issue that I've not heard addressed and the real cost, and I've also not heard the local control issue addressed. Our districts are doing a lot to prohibit bullying. Some have STARS programs. They're doing many things within the communities uh, and in their school districts, and um, they're not confident that um, that local control is going to be preserved. And so um, it's hard for me to, it's going to be very difficult for me to vote on this today because I've not been able to, to check back with my districts. I'm guessing many members at the table are like that. Uh, certainly there's been a lot of discussion and uh, we, I think it would be very helpful if we were able to uh, get with our uh, communities and see if this amendment really does address those issues. Now this, as I said, just came out at um, 8.39 this morning, but uh, Madam Chair, um, Senate File 2411 has been online and available for the public since, since March 6th. I will tell you that that anti-bullying bill uh, is based on the North Dakota model that has been tried and implemented. Uh, it's been rated A++ by anti-bullying.gov. Uh, Attorney General uh, Swanson, our Attorney General, uh, indicated that it was um, a model to replicate. And uh, I've not had any uh, concern about this bill, only support about uh, Senate File 2411. And so it does um, cause me pause to realize that we've had uh, uh, Senator Dibble's bill for uh, a good time here, and I appreciate the changes, Senator Dibble, but I don't know if those changes are sufficient enough to address the concerns that are, are in my district. I'm hoping, uh, Madam Chair, that we will be able to, we don't have to wait till next year, I am hoping we will be able to hear Senate File uh, 2411. It is tried, it's true, uh, it's, it's been um, implemented, it's not, uh, hasn't had any um, controversy or concern. And so I just put that out there uh, to the public and in, in front of the members that there is um, an alternative that, um, that has had, the, had public scrutiny and has been, um, has not had any concerns. So I, I, I would, I'm tempted to suggest that we table a vote on this bill until we've had a chance to really see how it's going to affect our districts. Um, I did listen to uh, Mr. Amoroso and uh, Ms. Schwab 
uh, Kelleher and, and take a great heart in that. Um, but I also know that uh, the school boards uh, support uh, Senate File 2411 as well. And so I, I would just hope that our committee could have time to thoughtfully review the changes that Senator Dibble has worked so hard on with the advocates. I want to know, I want to know where my district where my school districts stand on this. They've not had a chance to talk to me about this yet. I don't know um, where the teachers in my district stand on this. I don't know where, where the parents are. And this is not a, a proven and implemented uh, bill yet. And so, Madam Chair, I would ask that uh, we be able to vote on this uh, out of this committee after we've had a chance to see how our, um, see how our uh, stakeholders feel about this bill. So I'd ask that we uh, table this bill and come back with the ability to um, vote intelligently uh, on this bill. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so a couple of issues. Number one, this uh, bill will go to finance. That's your next stop. And no matter what we say here, we don't have a vote on what happens fiscally because I don't have the juris you don't we don't have the jurisdiction to address that issue. So that is the next stop. And I encourage members to uh, really uh, make sure you connect uh, with finance chair to address that concern. But we have no jurisdiction to address it here. I also would like to ask uh, perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Arneson to come and, and just provide very brief testimony on the local uh, authority because I, I think that Senator Dibble and Senator Clausen, that was kind of one of the main uh, aspects you address actually with the amendment in terms of really providing the, the the districts, I know that in my district we talk a lot about, you know, the, the whole issue with um, how do we deal with volunteers, how do we, uh, a lot of the language that you address was actually to make sure that there is uh, ample and very strong language to address the local uh, authority on this bill. I think that's kind of the thrust of, of, of this actual uh, amendment that you brought before us, uh, Senator. So I, I just want to make sure that we hear from the school administrators as to how strong that piece is, because actually that was, that was it. That was the most important aspect of this amendment. So uh, Mr. Anderson, if you could tell us a little bit about kind of what are your thoughts uh, with respect to how now in, in this bill kind of the, the local districts uh, will have the authority and the responsibility to work, uh, you know, with the, within their own staff, uh, uh, providing the information uh, to parents as well as making sure, that, you know, that the the the, pol the new uh, policies adopted are uh, incorporated into existing policies so that they don't have to create new ones. I think most of of what uh, is in this language actually. It's, it's very uh, empowering for the local districts, is, is my understanding. But if you could tell well, us and, what is your perception. And, and Madam Chair, I'll just, I'll just frame it by saying, um, you know, that's the balance we tried to strike. We tried to create some, some guideposts, if you will, um, you know, some, some, some threshold, some minimum threshold uh, uh, expectations and requirements, but leave a lot of the details to, to the locals. You know, training, for example, is not specified. Um, you know exactly how that's going to look. Um, uh, you know, uh, punitive measures again, pr pretty much silent on that, other than trying to emphasize changing the behavior, um, working with kids, um, not not necessarily responding with the punitive or punishment measure, but um, you know, understanding that bullying is complicated, um, and sometimes it just takes a word. Um, to a kid to help them understand the consequence and impact of, of, of what they do and say uh, has on, on others, developing those empathy, those uh, empath empathetic responses and the like. And so we tried to strike that balance and, and, and emphasize um, uh, a measure of, of local control and recognize that a lot of schools have already done a tremendous amount of, of really good work. Uh, Madam Chair, members, in, in response to your question, I think it's good to go all the way back to the initial draft of this that was going to require the department actually to engage in formal rulemaking that would kind of take it out of this setting and the policy would be drafted, you know, through rulemaking. Now that was taken out quite early as Senator Dibble noted before. But then in, in the amendment that you have in front of you, 
Um, and it, uh, this comes now to that these policies are going, the discipline policies are going to be, I'm sorry, the bullying policies are going to be adopted in the same cycle as other policies are adopted within the district. So it's not going to require additional work, and I think part of that was trying to address some of the costs, those were all worked into the, into the costing model, and that this went along the same cycle. If you notice, um, there's language added in the amendment 2.24 um, that adds to the extent practicable. I mean, it, it, again, it's a small piece, but it talks about making the process of constructing these policies or if you look in the language that is now is going to say e either to construct them or revise them where appropriate. I think what you're going to see is the School Board Association actually has a sample policy on this that they distribute widely to school districts now, um, and that there will be some revisions to that that will that will make that fit with with how this how this works. But these are this statute is this proposal is really designed to have local policies that are going to incorporate the definition um, that's contained here. If if you looked online at the Anoka Hennepin Public Schools policy, um, the strength of that policy is that it is, it, it, if, if you read it, it's a very common sense driven policy. I mean, and, and one of the things that happens with these things is, is um, because we want to add them in handbooks and we want to make them readily available, we want to have policies that kids can understand, you know, so they know what's going to protect them and they know what conduct they need to conform their behavior to. We think the new definition that's in here, if, if you notice the definition, we, we moved that provision that said um, behavior that constitutes a, a violation of the common law right to privacy underst as understood under Minnesota law. I practiced law for 34 years. I'm not exactly sure I understand what that standard is. I can guarantee you that 10th and 11th graders would not. So we've moved that out of there, out of the definition piece, and instead it's now in the examples may include provision there. And, and we think all of that is working towards making the policy stuff that happens locally a lot more common sense. You know, and, and really that is the goal. That the, it, It's an interesting thing in school policies as we draft them. The real target for drafting this policy are kids, you know, from, from uh, age 6 to 18. You know, and, and so we need language that, that those kids can understand, and we need to give districts the authority to put language in place. And the ANOCA policy, like I said, if I, would, I would urge any of the members that have a question about it, go online under their school board tab, and policies are there, and the bullying piece is there, and, and that is a very, in fact, we wanted to try to use that um, as a suggestion for the definition, but it's too, it, it's a little bit too common sense almost to have in state law. So this, it, it, I, I apologize for that. Yeah, I, I didn't mean that the way it came out. <laughs> but, um, but I think it does illustrate, you'd like to create an overall umbrella with this. You know, the districts have local discretion to do things like Anoka did, and, and I think that's what's being accomplished here. And I'm sure, I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Even if we, if you bring it before us, we'll make sure that it goes out of here in a different way. <laughs> It's not such common sense. Senator Peterson and Senator Nino. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just urge that we actually move to testimony, uh, considering the fact that we've got a lot of people here who may or may not be able to come back at 6 o'clock, and out of respect for those individuals, I think they ought to have their voice heard. And, and I'm sure the same goes for some of the media. And uh, they all took the time to come down here. And we, we're going to be back here, let's face it, we're going to be back here at 6 anyways. So the members, I think, can have plenty of time to speak uh, themselves into the night uh, if that's what they choose to do. That would be my request, Madam Chair. Okay, well, I want to hear from members <clears throat> to you. Um, so, so I want to make sure that, um, you know, as Senator Dibble says, you know, both uh, have plenty of testimony they would like to offer, and they are ready to offer that testimony. We are, we can be here until uh, late into the hours. Uh, the amendment that uh, was uh, of concern, or the language that was of concern to us, uh, has is in front of you, uh, Senator. I hear you know obviously you will have plenty of time to have your uh, committees. Uh, talk to the author before he goes to finance where issues around implementation will be discussed again in terms of funding. It will be going to the floor after that. Or I don't know, Senator, if you have any other stop that you need to make. So there will be ample opportunity for you to connect with your districts and hear concerns. And obviously in the floor, ample opportunity for you to offer any changes that you wish to, to make. 
Uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, uh, Madam Chair, I uh, think uh, Senator uh, Peterson makes a good point. And uh, by knowing that we will be adjourning and coming back at 6, if we can get from the committee um, actual language that is revised, if we can get the revised bill as it is in our with our amendments, uh, it's possible we could even send those uh, to our school districts um, while we're on recess here. So if we can get the bill in its amended form in a digital um, form so that someone could receive it and actually read what the amendment is that we're voting on with the original language, um, I think that would be helpful in getting some of the, um, some of the feedback that we so need. Senator, you have that in front of you already. Well, uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Senator. Uh, we do have that in front of us, but um, it would be helpful if we saw the amendment uh, so that someone who is reading this could actually read the actual bill that is in its amended form. We, we have both, Senator. Uh, so in front of you, you have the 832 amendment, and yes. then uh, it's in the form that it will actually, uh, mm -hmm. so this is en engrossed. Engrossed, thank you, yeah. I do have that. Yeah, so, so the only thing that the senator did to be able just to facilitate the revision yeah. was to, to put it into the two pages, but both versions are here, so. Exactly, we'll send yeah. that out, thank you. Yeah, so, so that's what's already been done. Uh, yeah. Who else had a question? Madam Chair, I, I thank you. I agree with Senator right. Peterson. Let's get these uh, some of these testifiers up here. I think we're in a bit of a stall here. Uh, let's get them up here. Let's hear them. They're the voice of the people. They're here. They want to speak and be heard. So the reason, uh, Senator Chamberlain, that I am concerned about is that uh, there are 75 people who wish to testify on issues that are not in front of us. So, uh, so I'd Madam be very Chair, well is, that a, is that a tacit admission you don't want to let the people speak to the bill? Four pages of changes, you don't want them to speak to that? No, Senator, I just don't want people to come over here to talk about issues that are not being uh, presented to for you to decide. Well, then, uh, Senator, M Madam Chair, then I suggest you take action and decide which way we're going to go. Either you're going to let them speak or we're going to vote on this bill and move forward. That's what I'm trying to do, Senator. So I'm asking for input from committee members. Um, so let's do this, uh, Senator Dibble. Why don't we entertain testimony on, uh, obviously, the language that is uh, before us, in front of us, and uh, begin our testimony, and we're going to hear from uh, supporters, a uh, couple of supporters, and then we're going to hear from a couple. I want to make sure that we give priority for, uh, for people who have traveled long distances so that they can uh, get on uh, their way back home. So any people in the audience or uh, who wish to testify who have traveled a long distance and would like to be heard before uh, 6 p.m.? If you have traveled a distance, please come to the table. Uh, we, we really want to honor your time and, and uh, want to send you on your way. So uh, please make sure that you approach the table if you have traveled a long distance to come to testify before our committee. We're going to give you priority to address the committee. Don't be shy. May I, may I ask a question? I, I have traveled about a half an hour, but I have kids to pick up at school, yes, absolutely. which is also very, uh, it's, it'll be an emergency absolutely. for me. If I, I hear you. Okay. Please go ahead and, and proceed with your testimony. Okay. We appreciate that. My name is Michelle Lefevre, and I'm from Maple Grove, Minnesota. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I have never done this before. I am absolutely brand new to this entire process, other than what I learned in elementary and secondary. Um, I have many concerns with the original <laughs> bill. As the rest of you have noted, you have received an amendment this morning. That I don't believe has been available to the public yet. So my, uh, my comments, I'm trying to limit to the implementation of the bill as it stood, taking into account what I've heard this morning of the amendment. Um, as I said, I have many concerns, but I'll try to just keep, keep this brief. Um, I'm a parent. I'm not a school administrator. I'm not a teacher. 
but I do understand as the bill was written that the Minnesota School Board was not in favor of the bill, that the Minnesota Association of School Administrators was not in favor of the bill. I'm not sure where they stand right now, but that tells me a lot. They are the people that will be administering this bill. Um, I'd like to address the implementation. Um, I did have some, some notes on how volunteers would need to be trained. I understand that the training is lessened, which is a good thing. Um, but I do have a question about the school climate center. The fact that it would be a state organization overseeing or at least advising and supervising bullying policy concerns me. The reason it does is because we have individual school districts, individual schools that have their own bullying issues and I believe that would be very hard to create a policy from the state, state level and also be able to include all of the issues that each individual district and school may be dealing with. Um, my other other um, note here and my other concern is for the teachers. The teachers are there to teach my children. They're already aware of bullying issues. They already have to follow school policy. There's already a Minnesota statute. I'm very happy with that. When I hear bullying, if my kid is bullying or bullied, mama bear comes out. So trust me when I say I am concerned with bullying. However, I do not want my teachers to have to spend more time inside of school and outside of school tracking what the, their kids are doing with each other. I want my teachers to spend their time focused on teaching my children, on educating my children. So I will close in saying that bullying is bad. Nobody, nobody likes bullying but I don't believe that this bill is the way to address the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaFaver. Uh, any questions for the testifier members? We really appreciate that you came. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other testifier that wishes to approach the table? Senator Dibble. Madam Chair, we have uh, Walter Roberts who's come from uh, Mankato. Okay, thank Minnesota you. Minnesota River Valley who can speak to some of the uh, elements that are in front of us. In, in the amendment. Thank you, Senator. And uh, again, you know, any any Absolutely. testifiers that ha who have come from uh, Greater Minnesota, we really would like you to kind of be close to the table because we're going to give you priority. Obviously, you have to travel back home, so we want to respect your schedule. If you could hold on just for a second for your testimony, Senator Peterson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, I know Mr. Roberts and Mr. Roberts has testified in every committee uh, related to this bill and I certainly don't have a personal problem with Mr. Roberts at all testifying here today but um, I wouldn't con I, I wouldn't consider Mr. Roberts a lay person off of the street um, I, I, I suppose he may not be able to come back but uh, I've heard him testify multiple times and I know there's many people in the audience who probably won't come back here again um, for what it's worth it's your it's up to you uh, madam chair um, but um, that's that's my two cents. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I promise to be brief. As co-chair of the task force, I'm here to say that we have looked at the changes that are being proposed uh, in this new amendment, and we endorse it. We support it. We believe that it is it will be easier to implement. We've heard testimony today to that effect from many of the groups that have been, uh, that will be charged with implementing it. And um, so on behalf of the task force, that is uh, our official position is that we do endorse the changes. We know the authors have worked very, very hard to make this a better bill. They have listened to a lot of input from respective groups. And I believe, and the task force believes that they have been extraordinarily um, responsive to that input. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Senator Chamberlain, do you no, have a question? No, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. That's fine. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to recognize that the other co-chair of the task force is here, Julie Herzog from the Pacer Center. I just want to also say um, for the record that um, uh, uh, conceding on the, the, the measurements, uh, the public accountability data analysis element, um, 
deferring that to maybe some future point in time, as well as um, making the uh, IEPs 504 planning process uh, more permissive was a, a significant concession on the part of um, the representatives of the task force, as well as the organizations um, they represent. That represents a, a very significant compromise, significant cost savings, of course, in the bill. That's important and ease of implementation. Um, but uh, but it should be recognized as a, a, a fairly significant and strong recommendation that came out of the task force um, and uh, represents a good compromise. Thank you very much, Senator. Any other individual who have traveled, please approach the table. Uh, could I have, uh, uh, make sure, I, I, I would like to, uh, you know, I have to go to higher education, so I, I prefer not to come at 6 p.m. But I would like to know who has traveled uh, who come to testify, uh, if, if I can have a show of hands so that I can have a sense of how many more minutes. So we have one, two, uh, please approach the table. Please uh, get in the front because we want to make sure that I, I give you an opportunity to testify. Um, if you are representing the kind of the same organization, we don't need to hear seven people from the same organization. We want to make sure that you know, we have a representative. So please go ahead and approach Madam, the table. Madam Chair, just one process thing. Can we Senator kind of do an alternating thing we had? Uh, I would also agree with Senator Peterson. If we got professionals that have done this before, let the other people speak, and then let's do it in an alternate fashion. So we've heard a pro, a, a pro, and we hear a con, someone that's here to uh, express concerns about this legislation. Thank you, Senator Chamberlain. I think that's fair. Thank Absolutely. You. So we, we want to hear from community members. Please go ahead and introduce yourself for the tape, uh, your full name, and the, the if you're a parent or if you re, uh, represent an organization or a school, let us know. Uh, uh, chairman and members, my name is Jean Osterby. I live in Wyzetta. I have to get a ride to get here. That's why I wanted to. I'm not a member of any organization. I'm speaking as a retired public school teacher, 27 years, retired 22 years. I wanted to share my experience and why I'm really concerned about this. I taught third grade and sixth grade, so elementary is my background. 22 years in Anoka Hennepin, which was interesting to hear uh, uh, referred to. Three, uh, five years in Hopkins. Um, I uh, have worked, this is my first year in 22 years of retirement, not being a, vo uh, a volunteer tutor and so forth, but this summer I've got a parent who wants me to work with two children. I, um, I, I want to state again that each district and each school has their own rules about discipline and bullying and that, and I feel it needs to be a local community concern where it's teacher and child and parent working together for any discipline or any kind of issue. I don't like it to be a big thing. And I wanted to share what I came to conclusions in my 27 years of teaching. The first day of school was always, let's make our class rules. And I let the children decide what rules they wanted to have in their class. They knew what it had been like in other classes. And I felt it was important for them to have a say. So we discussed the rules. And way back, I've been retired 22 years. We didn't have whiteboards. We didn't have a lot of stuff. So I would write it on newsprint when the children agreed on a rule. And then when we had all the rules, I would then refer each rule up to the golden rule, which at that time we were able to have in our class. Uh, and I also, and those rules, the golden rule and the class rules were up for nine months. So the children always knew what the rules were. Uh, then also I want to say we had a Bible in our classroom, which you don't have anymore, but the district provided it. I didn't bring it and it was always available. Then I also came to another uh, tool that I kind of, after reading a lot of information, because I think teachers are always looking for new and better ways to do teaching. Sometimes I have learned that those new ways are not better ways. But I c came to the conclusion that instead of me making a big deal about something that might be happening, 
uh, I told the children I would go over to the board and there was a special spot and I would write the names on the board of any children that I felt I needed to talk to privately, privately. And they knew, okay, that meant stop doing what I'm doing and get back to what the class is doing and what you're supposed to be doing. And then we would find a time and I would talk privately, maybe to just one student, maybe to two or three students, and we would work it out. And if a parent needed to be uh, in, uh, contacted, we would contact the parent. But it was always a private thing. And if it got to be a really big thing, then maybe the whole class have, had to have a discussion. But I think it's really important, instead of all these rules mandated down from government, that it should be kept local and private so that children, other children don't need to know what, what, what the name was up on the board for. So I would like to get back to local control. I think that's very important. And I appreciate being able to share what I've felt about. And as I was listening to different people speak and the senators discuss, I thought, wow, I want to get up and add my two bits to this. And thanks so much for listening. If you have any questions, I'd appreciate that. I want you to also know I called every one of your offices. I do not have a computer. But I think eyeball to eyeball or ear to mouth is much better way because you can have a discussion. And so I did leave my message on your phones or, or your message machines, and I had a number of aides in, in, that listened to me. And they said, what is your name again and your telephone number? So you've all got that message, but I wanted to get up here in person because this is my first year coming down to to the Capitol in about four or five years. So thank, thank you for you listening so much. to me. We totally appreciate uh, your commitment to children and we appreciate that you made the time to come. Thank, thank you. you. Next. <coughs> Hello, Chairperson and Committee. My name is Ani Weberg and I'm 13 years old. I go to middle school in Dodge Center. Thank you for coming to committee. Uh, could you make sure that uh, you provide your name in the That's form right. because we um, we need to have a record of the people who testified before the committee. So thank you. Please go ahead and proceed with your testimony. I know there are a lot of ways you can bully someone. There's cyberbullying, physical, and mental. I was bullied at my old school. One girl made fun of me all the time for things I said or something I did. I've had times where kids would get in my face and threaten me or threaten to take my stuff. That's usually why kids get bullied at my school, for things they say that somebody else decides they don't like or for things they do that someone doesn't like. I also admit that I have bullied um, other kids before too. I know it was wrong and I'm sorry for um, whoever I did it to. I've learned that you never know what kids are going through at home or what their parents treat you or someone else like. So I'm careful now with how I treat other students. There was a there was this boy who uh, really didn't smell very good and was, uh, wasn't the popular, and I bullied him too. Um, I really don't like this bully bill signals out kids who get more special protection from bullying. I don't think that's fair. All kids should be protected from bullying and nobody should get more help than someone else. Besides, usually kids at my school get bullied for something they say or do or the way they act, not because of who they are or the way they look. This bullying bill chooses 18 different kinds of kids as if they are the most important to protect. That doesn't make sense. Um, and most kids who are bullied are not bullied because they are in those groups. So instead of listing kids by special groups, a lot to help stop bullying should just say simply that all kids are protected. I think that if people really wanted to make schools a better place and help stop bullying, the best way to do that is for the adults to be involved. Teachers should help bull stop bullying when they see it happen in schools. The kids' parents should know about it too so they can help. If I were going to make a law to help stop bullying, I would make sure that no kids were singled out for special protections. I would make the law be the same for everyone, and I would make it. I would make um, sure that the law got the adults involved, the people in charge, and school, and the parents of the kids. I hope you agree with me, and I hope 
you would not want to make a school feel like some kids get more protection than others. Thank you for letting me be okay. here today. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Torres and members of the committee. My name is Kathy Trosbeck. I'm a parent and I'm here today to oppose the spell. My son committed suicide eight years ago after being bullied on a school bus. He was only in sixth grade. He was only 12. He was a bright, lovely boy who loved airplanes, reading, learning. He had dreams of being an aeronautical engineer, building a restaurant in a treehouse, and feeding the poor. Tom loved to give big bear hugs to laugh. He loved to get to know other people, and he loved life. We decided to send Tom to Fridley Middle School to their International Baccalaureate program. We wanted Tom to be challenged so that he could have a chance to make his dreams come true. But it didn't work out that way. It was in December on Christmas break that Tom first told us of being bullied. He said it was consistently happening in the hallways between classes. It just happened that we had parent-teacher conferences right after break, so we brought it up at the teacher conference that time. That's what parents are told to do first, so that's what we did. His teacher said that she had talked to the girl. I'm not sure what was done, but Tom said things were better a week later when I asked him. But it wasn't. Many times children do not report their bullying. Tom only told us a portion of what his was. I don't know why, and I never will. He came home from school that Wednesday. That day was my granddaughter's first birthday. That day my mom had brought a lemon meringue pie to our house because it was Tom's favorite. That day was sunny but cold outside. He came into the house. He took his backpack off and dropped it on the floor. He went outside saying that he had a project for school the next day. I was on the computer looking for airfare tickets to Florida to see our, granda our daughter graduate from Florida Tech. I didn't get to talk to him. I didn't get any last words with him. Tom went out to our barn. He took a handsaw that belonged to his great-grandfather. He cut the rope off of the sled. He stepped onto a toy riding tractor that he used to play on. He stood on the ledge, took the rope, and he hung himself. I don't know why. Tom was an ordinary boy who would not have fit into any category listed in this bill. He was just a little quirky boy who loved to laugh, he loved to learn, and I don't know why, but he did. The next day when a school bus came up to pick Tom up, I had to go out and tell the driver. She looked down at me and I, after I told her and said, he said he was going to. The kids were so mean. Didn't you know? I was just stunned. I just looked at her and I said, no, I didn't. I didn't know, and she didn't report it. There were no reports made. She should have. She was supposed to report it, any abuse that she witnessed, but she didn't. So I didn't get the chance to protect my son. I didn't get the chance to fix this problem for him, and that's what parents are supposed to do. I found out about what was happening on the bus in a roundabout way. One of the grief counselors who helped at the school told a reporter of what a student had told him, and he wrote a story in the paper about it. The student had told him the kids on the bus were telling Tom he should kill himself, and they were telling him different ways that he should do it. A week after that, I started having panic attacks. I started thinking about the kids on the bus and whether their parents knew of what was happening. All I could think was, what was that one kid thinking who suggested that Tom take a rope and hang himself. Did his parents know? That kid needed to be watched. He needs to be talking to somebody. Has, he's got to go through his whole life with this. And his parents need to know, and they need to watch him. Then I also began to worry about the bus driver. Had anything been done for her? Had she received counseling, debriefing? She also has to go through her life knowing what she hadn't done. I oppose this bill because it does not protect other children like Tom who are bullied because they are just quirky. They don't fit into any category. 
all children need to be protected equally without singling out special types of students legislators deem are more worthy of protection. I oppose this bill because parents need to know what's happening to their children at school. A child matures and grows through experiences at school and at home. But the parents are the only ones that journey with the child through their whole life. Parents must be notified. If I had been told, Tom might still be alive today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Transvig. Um, we, we really appreciate that, that you came and shared the story of your son. Um, members, as you recall, uh, we have significant stories and significant issues. Um, people outside who wish to share with you, um, you know, obviously their painful experiences uh, who also support the bill, so we have both. Um, I am going to, um, as the testifiers, we, we are here in trying to figure out how we can provide, you know, um, enough substantive language to implement this legislation. We care very deeply about what is happening to children. And I would like to ask uh, perhaps Senator Dibble, um, I think Senator Dibble, you can respond from, from where you are. I want you to please clarify to, to our students and to parents uh, that we are not being selective with this bill as to who gets protection and who doesn't. And uh, I, I believe that we work very hard to make sure that this protection and, and this environment is safe, that, that we create environments that are safe for every child, no matter who they are. <coughs> I want you to know, uh, Ms. Uh, Trasvik, that I have a lot of children who actually are very smart kids who we, we will you know, think of them as nerds or introverts who, who have been bullied just because they are, you know, kids who typically are not very social, who are not with, you know, uh, 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 trying to uh, follow trends. So we, there is, you're absolutely correct that we need to offer protections and need to make sure that we uh, create safe environments for every child, no matter who they are. And I believe that this legislation uh, strongly provides uh, some safety measures for every child. But Senator Dibble, could you elaborate a little bit on that, or Senator Clausen, if you could help, you know, uh, uh, our testifiers um, actually understand that particular piece of the legislation um, that is being proposed. Great. Th uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, I would uh, call members' attention to on the A32 um, uh, engrossed version of the amendment, um, uh, lines 1.14 to 1.17. You don't typically include purpose statements. Um, we can debate whether or not that's a good idea. Um, I think it's a good idea in this instance. But it says that uh, this legislation is intended to prevent bullying by a student uh, to facilitate a safe and conducive educational environment for all students ameliorate the effects of bullying and teach students the boundaries of socially appropriate behavior. Um, then I would also um, call members' attention to um, uh, uh, down a little bit further on the same page, line 1.19. Uh, this section applies to bullying by a student against another student enrolled in a public school, et cetera. Um, and then I would just simply uh, call your attention to 2.34 prohibited conduct need not be based on any particular characteristic defined in this paragraph or chapter 363A. Um, and there's at least one other spot where, and I just can't remember exactly where it is, where we affirm that um, uh, this, this, these policies uh, and this approach is designed to protect all students. Um, at the same time, it's, it's important to recognize that, as I said in my earlier comments, um, uh, bullying is, uh, by a factor of 70 percent or more, um, uh, targeted at students who are perceived to be different for whatever reason. Um, uh, you know, some reasons more than others, uh, and uh, policies that are proven effective um, give clear guidance 
uh, in direction uh, to those who are responsible for the adults in the in the building and the adults in the school community who are responsible for recognizing it, responding to it, implementing the provisions of the policy, and doing some work around prevention. Um, failure to do that uh, means that that uh, oftentimes that's not clear, and or there's significant social pressure to not recognize or respond to <coughs> bullying when it occurs against some particular subgroups. And the research and the data show us that those kids experience bullying as if there is no policy whatsoever. So we're trying to strike that balance, make sure that these, these policies are effective for all students, uh, in particular those who receive a disproportionate amount of this targeted behavior. Thank you, Senator. Uh, please proceed with your testimony. Could you give your name and, yes. and let My us name know who you represent and what area you come from? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I am from Brainerd, Minnesota, and I uh, grew up in Wadena. Um, the, the bill that I saw, it is sponsored, or not sponsored, but pushed through by Outfront. Um, they're, they're huge and huge supporting this. That tells me, indicates that all children are not protected by this bill. As a, uh, a young man, when I was growing up, I, I grew up in extremely poor circumstances. We were 14 Sorry, kids. Sorry, but we didn't get your name. Well, uh, Douglas the... Kern uh, from Crow Wing. Okay, thank and you. And I grew up in extremely, um, uh, it was rough. There was 14 kids in a two-bedroom house with an outhouse. Uh, didn't have, we had running cold water. I, I was going through years where I was beat, I was um, kicked, I mean it was uh, years of this because I didn't smell good. And there were other reasons too, I, I was, I'm a very sensitive guy. Um, there was a point there in my life where after being beat for almost two years where I wanted to take my life. And I got to the point where I couldn't tell anybody, it's like nothing, was, it, nothing seemed like it would help, it would only make it worse. I uh, went to the school one day with a butcher knife, and when the kids surrounded me, I told them, I said, I, I figured it was going to be me or them. I, I, not too long ago, my son went to school, and he was bullied. Um, he got uh, one tooth knocked out. Uh, a few months later, he got kicked in the groin so hard that he couldn't pee for a month. Uh, we had to go to a urologist, a urologist, had to have him checked over, and, and then the question was, do we just let him struggle through it, or do we uh, catheterize him? Uh, which could cause damage down the road. Uh, my boy was bullied because he was a good kid, a Christian boy that was doing the right thing. And just no rhyme, no reason, but whether he smelled bad, whether he was, it was his religion or, or that he didn't look right, or if he was a homosexual, bisexual, transgender, it does not matter. All of our children do need to be protected, every single one of them. And if we don't protect them, shame on us. Thank if we do not much. protect every one of our children, shame on us. Uh, we fully agree with you. We yep. fully agree with you, and uh, very much this legislation is about protecting all children. So we have, uh, it will be unfair that we hear all the people that oppose, since I say we have a number of people who want to testify. So we have heard three people, three people who are opposed. I am going to call three people who support the bill, if you could please, and just make sure um, you approach the uh, microphone. So if you're not uh, if you're not a supporter, you can uh, please leave the table. We're going to give an opportunity and be fair. So we heard from three opponents. We're going to hear from three supporters. Should I go? Good afternoon, Ch Chair Torres Ray and committee members. My name is Jay Bates. I live in Minnetonka, and I am a senior in high school. I was the victim of both cyberbullying and outright verbal bullying in my school from about fifth grade until eighth grade, with continued incidents well throughout my high school years. I'm adopted from South Korea, and I struggled greatly with my racial identity as a child. In middle school, amidst trying to find some closure in regards to my feelings over my adoption, I began to receive racially, racially charged bullying from my peers. Kids used to call me a chink, and they would yell chink at me from down the hallway. They used to bump into me on purpose and tell me to open my eyes. Um, they used to call me a commie and a communist, implying that I was North Korean. People often asked me if I was going to shoot up my school post Virginia Tech shooting. Eventually, my racial, the racial slurs turned into anti-gay slurs because of speculation over my sexuality and gender identity arose. 
I was relieved that the racial bullying had stopped, but my tormentors had found a new facet of my identity that they disliked even more. I am a transgender student, but I had not been out in middle school. There was a day in particular that I had been walking through my school near the end of my near the end of my school year and I was alone. From behind me I could hear multiple voices and they started to yell anti-LGBT slurs at me. They called me a faggot repeatedly and they told me to turn around because they were talking to me. I ignored them and continued to walk the safest route to uh, the nearest adult, as I'd been told to do on multiple occasions. They sped up behind me and I feared for my safety as their voices got louder and they repeatedly called me a dumb fag. Eventually, I turned around and I told them to shut up and to leave me alone because I was done listening to them. A teacher finally intervened, but instead of yelling at the three boys who were following me, reprimanded me for my reprimanded me for my language. The three boys fled while I was being lectured, and when I told the teacher what had just occurred, she briefly apologized to me, told me to let the principal know, but that I had to watch my own language. I know so many kids in my situation who stood up for themselves um, and ended up getting in trouble just because the t when the final teacher finally noticed, um, it was them that, that was, it was them that got in trouble. Um, I reported each and every incident of my bullying from fifth to eighth grade, from fifth to eighth grade, and in high school. And every single time, I was told that the administrators, the teachers, and the staff members would make a note of it. And eventually, there was no end result. I suffered from major depression from the time that I was about twelve until recently. I also suffered from self-harm due to my peers tearing apart nearly every aspect of my personal identity throughout my school day. The end of my torture only came after I voiced suicidal thoughts to staff, to social work staff at my school and had a incident of attempts at suicide. The things only changed because people finally realized how much the, how much their, um, how much their words and their actions were truly hurting me. Now I'm an advocate and a voice for victims of harassment and bullying at my high school. Students and even parents come to me seeking advice and resources, but each and every person who comes to me has the same exact thing to say, that they are coming to me for resources because they don't feel the staff has done anything, and that they don't feel that the administration would ever do much of anything. I graduate this year and I don't want other kids to have to attempt or commit suicide just to be acknowledged, um, just to be acknowledged that they're being hurt. Thank you, Chair Torres Ray and committee members for allowing me to speak with you today. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Please proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Torres Ray and committee members. Uh, my name is Alexa Grinke and I live in Bloomington, Minnesota. I'm also a senior in high school. Uh, last year, the night before school began, I received a phone call from two fellow classmates pretending to be volunteers gathering opinions about Minnesota's proposed constitutional ban on same-sex marriage. They seemed friendly and it was an issue I cared deeply about, so I talked to them for a couple minutes. Uh, I told them I was a supporter of the freedom to marry uh, and I was so because I identified as gay. After that, they began calling me anti-LGBT slurs and telling me that I would go to hell. I immediately hung up. I was upset, angry, and confused. Later that night, uh, a fellow acquaintance contacted me to tell me that they had witnessed the call take place and shared with me the names of the students who had placed it. The next day, my mom and I went to my school. We reported the incident and requested that somebody talk to the students involved. After a week or two without any update from the school, I scheduled a meeting with the Dean of Students. He told me that while he had heard of the event, he had not heard about my request for some type of resolution. He also told me that because, uh, he told me that sometimes the best course of action was to do nothing. He also told me that because the students had transferred out of the district after the event took place, that there was nothing he could do. I felt like I never got resolution. The students who had harassed me could continue to harass others without any consequence. I felt like the administration did not care if I felt safe or supportive in my own school, and the disorganized and uncoordinated way that they addressed the situation added to my distress. I urge you to pass the Safe and Supportive Minnesota Schools Act so students in situations like mine can get the resolution and support that I never received. 
It makes my heart ache that my fellow students in my school and in schools around Minnesota are facing worse than I can imagine. I am lucky. I've only faced isolated incidents of bullying, and my family and friends are very supportive of who I am. But I know, and we all know, that there are students out there without anybody to turn to for help. For me and for those students, I urge you to pass the Safe and Supportive Schools Act. Chair Torres Ray and committee members, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. You are the final testifier. Uh, members, I'm going to take a vote uh, after this testimony. I appreciate the testimony and I appreciate the number of notes that I have in front of me. This is a very painful experience for many kids and many parents, and I wish I could have hours to hear you. Absolutely, I do. I do. I have close friends who have gone through this. So this is very, very emotional, very painful for many of us. So you will be the last testifier, and after you, we are going to take a vote on this bill. So please proceed. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Torres Ray and committee members. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you all today. I greatly appreciate it. My name is Nabil Azuzi. I'm a senior at Great River School in St. Paul, Minnesota. The school that I go to is a very small school. With that come some positives and some drawbacks. The school that I go to has a very tight-knit community, but I'm the only Muslim in my high school. I have, received, I have received hurtful comments as a result of a lack of awareness about Muslims, and if I were not as outspoken a person as I am, it could have very easily led to bullying. When the U.S. government captured Osama bin Laden a few years ago, a student came up to me and said, sorry, your leader died. It is hurtful comments like this that make me feel uncomfortable at times in my environment, and I noticed immediately after the situation that other students started to make similar comments. I put a stop to it immediately because it seemed like bullying and other students might not have that courage. Fortunately, I have not experienced bullying at my current school beyond that. A few years ago, however, I was not the only Muslim at my school, and the other Muslim students ended up transferring due to insulting comments being thrown their way constantly. Dirty terrorist, kebab killer, and other hurtful, juvenile insults were hurled at the students, who were at the time 7th and 8th graders. My experience with bullying continues beyond my current school. When I was younger, I was the victim of bullying in my elementary school years. From third to fifth grade, I was teased and bullied by simple fact of being one of the smallest kids at school. Wedgies, getting shoved in lockers, and swirlies were all a part of my daily reality and made me go home to my parents crying quite frequently and made me feel unsafe at school. I was not the only student either. I've seen countless students get made fun of constantly for being seen as different in any way, and this leads them to feeling unsafe in school. These two experiences, or these multiple experiences, have shaped my thoughts on bullying and is why I believe we need this bill to be passed. I love having the ability to go to a school where I currently feel comfortable, and I believe that every student in the state should have that opportunity as well. This bill would not only be a huge help for students everywhere, but it would also be a wise investment in our, in, our, um, in our state as well. When students have the incentive and comfort to stay in school, we are educating our youth and we're helping increase our workforce and productivity for future years. Ending bullying in, in our youth also ends bullying for future generations, and it's a continual cycle of positivity that starts with passing this bill. Chair Torres Ray and committee members, I, d I greatly thank, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak with you all today. Thank you very much. Senator Dibble, if you could please approach the microphone. Uh, members, as you have heard, uh, this is a continuation of, of hearings that we had last time. I received you know, multiple notes that came from outside, individuals who wish to share with you their stories and, and tragic situations. That is the very reason we're doing this. That's the very reason we started this conversation uh, years ago, and uh, this is the conclusion today. So, Senator Dibble, if you uh, could make some final remarks, and we're going to proceed to take a vote. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. I, I appreciate the, um, the time, the respectful nature of the, of the conversation, the the airing of, of concerns, um, and I think I think you said it well. Um, you know, we we know for a fact that um, bullying. You know, I, I think Mr. Aronson said it well. You know, wh why do we even need this bill? Unfortunately, we do. Um, uh, a lot of schools are doing great things. A lot of schools are trying to do great things and not quite hitting the mark. And some schools just just aren't responding. The reality of kids' lives is what I continue to focus on. Um, I have for many years working 
uh, with young people who have been at the forefront of this entire movement asking us to make this change to solve this issue in their lives. I think the time has come for us to step up and take action as they've asked us to do um, because we know bullying occurs. It has real harmful consequence and effect uh, both in the immediate and the long term uh, rising to the level of uh, incredible tragedy in many instances. Um, and we know that something can be done. That's the key difference. The research shows us something can be done. We can respond effectively. We can change the climate, the atmosphere, um, so that kids like Nabil can feel comfortable going to school every day and not having to make that choice. Do I go to school or do I feel safe? Thank you, Matt, Madam Chair. Madam Chair Thank you, Senator Dibble, for uh, working so hard to get input from the community and to address some of the practical concerns. I know that uh, many of the people that you uh, would have been working with actually didn't agree with this, but they accommodated these changes, so we totally appreciate it. Final brief comments, Senator Peterson, Senator Nino, Senator Chamberlain. Madam Chair, um, earlier in the uh, committee hearing, we made a conscious decision to move to public testimony um, with the understanding that we would be con continuing this hearing into the evening. This de that decision has been changed on the fly. I mean, there's, uh, I don't know how many amendments are here from the minority members of the committee. I don't have any, but in the interest of process, there's, you cannot possibly consider this a fair hearing without considering the amendments of the minority. Uh, Senator, uh, I asked the committee, you wanted to hear testimony. We had an hour and 45 minutes to do this, and nobody mentioned to me that you had an amendment. Uh, there were two amendments that were presented. This is the first I hear. I don't know, Member CPU. With all due respect, Madam Chair, um, it was very clear with your stated intention that we would be back here at 6 o'clock in the evening. That's on the record. It's on, it's on the, recor the yeah. recording of this meeting. So, so here and we're we've just been notified that you're going to call the end of the meeting prior to our ability to, to at least offer amendments, which undoubtedly uh, uh, in almost all cases, will be defeated by the majority. But this is not a this is not a hearing, a fair hearing, um, without the ability for the minority members to conduct this in a way that's frankly uh, worthy of this institution. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm I'm just trying to understand. So so, <clears throat> we wanted to hear testimony. We we opened this to hear testimony. You know, of individuals uh, with very painful stories, and so. Uh, I ask members, so how many amendments do we have? I, I don't want to close. Uh, Senator Peterson, do not believe for a moment that I am trying to reconfigure process or do something that is against the protocol or the rules of the Senate. Absolutely, I will not do that. For this bill or any other bill, ever, I will not do that. And you know that quite well. I pulled this out of finance in order to have this conversation right now on this amendment since Thursday. You've had this uh, opportunity to talk to constituents and everything. They, we've been hearing from everyone. That's why the amendment was not before you. I just uh, also received the amendment because we've been talking to school administrators to make sure that everything is in place. So I would like to know who has an amendment. How many amendments do we have? I can come back at 6. So you have one? No. Oh. I can answer that in more completion, Madam Chair. Okay, thank I am you, aware Senator Nino. How many? Twelve amendments that have been drafted. Twelve so that amendments is your, have been drafted th that by is the minority. The, the floor of amendments that exist. Now, okay. unfortunately, I don't know if all of them will be offered <coughs> because we were having amendments drafted to potential new language that might exist. Okay. That we didn't have a chance to review. Excuse me, review. Okay. Uh, it, so you don't know. I personally didn't see this new language until I arrived okay. in the room here today. Okay. So, so you may have amendment. You may may not have amendments because you uh, really were not aware of the amendment language, and that could be taken care of in the floor. Correct, Senator Nina. And, and, and Madam Chair, quite quite frankly, this bill came back to this committee because it was flawed. Correct. And we just and this that. bill, in my opinion, is still flawed. Okay. That's what this committee process is for, and to rush the process is just wrong. Uh, Senator, we're going to take a vote on an amendment that clearly has been supported by large constituency groups that work on this for six months. Okay, so, so the vote before us is on issues that have been vetted. We've met with people throughout the district, uh, throughout the state of Minnesota. We've been 
You know, so we're addressing that. Now, if you have amendments that, you know, you feel this amendment does not fix that, we have the floor and the schedule will be open for you to have hours of debate on the issue. Madam Chair. Senator Nino. We don't, how many times have we talked on the floor of the Senate that we shouldn't be writing legislation on the floor? That's what the committee process is for. That's what we do in the policy committee. We do policy. If I go to the floor and I start offering these amendments, I'm going to get asked, why did you do that in committee? Okay. And then the argument's going to be, well, it should have been vetted in committee where you can have testimony. Okay. <clears throat> this so, is where we do it. All right. So you wish to come back at 6 and prepare your amendments? That will give you about three hours <laughs> to check and see if the amendments actually are, have been taken care of in the amendment that was offered or not. Is that fair, Senator Nino? Would you like to come back at 6 p.m. to, to address that? Well, I'd, I'd be fine staying if we can, but at 6 p.m. would be fine at, at, at least have in that a circumstance. Conflict with all members going to different committees, that's well, the reason. At least in that circumstance for myself, uh, I'll actually have the ability to absorb some of this, what's now newly adopted language. I appreciate that it was emailed out this morning, but I, I didn't get a chance to see my email. I didn't even know that this language had been released until I got okay. to committee. So, uh, it would be Senator Chamberlain. Madam Chair, what I'd suggest that either tonight or I know I know we have a tight schedule, but this is an important bill. Yep. And uh, I would either suggest coming back tonight or some other day this week or Saturday. This is an important bill. And I must say, when they reconvened to negotiate the settlement in this bill, they didn't contact anybody who was the other side. They got together with some folks that they could make a deal with. And again, the deal just excluded administrators from doing some work, which I'm all for. But uh, I would suggest uh, we meet again tonight or at another time this week. This is a substantial bill. It has serious implications. And we can see by the people here today that uh, there's great interest in it. In the, in the name of fairness and equity and process and the law and the rules, that we, uh, we do just that. Thank you, Senator. So I have heard you. Clearly, you want to entertain these amendments. I would like to uh, ask the staff to organize the amendments so we uh, make sure that we have all of the amendments. Uh, we have the room reserved for six, from 6 to 8 p.m., I believe, right? Uh, room, what room is this? Uh, room 15. So I want to make sure that the minority will have an opportunity to present their <coughs> amendments tonight. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, obviously make sure that uh, the um, author is aware of those amendments in case, you know, those amendments have been taken care of. I would like to ask <coughs> members to please make sure he has them so that he can speak uh, about whether or not those amendments were incorporated into the amendment, because I know a lot of them were related to the issues that Senator Clausen worked on with administrators, so that in the uh, um, event that we can, you know, just really save some time, we can address that issue. So we are going to recess and reconvene at 6 p.m. Thank you, members.